Welcome back to Brandon Wilborn's Fantasy Fiction, where fans of classic fantasy adventures can hear the serialized audiobooks of a fellow nerd and indie author completely for free. I'm your author, narrator, and host, Brandon Wilborn, and I'm also the nerd. I want to significantly, severely, uh, <laughs> I almost said severely thank you, but I want to sincerely thank you for listening this week. And obviously, uh, my words are not working properly, so we'll see how, we, how this goes. The story portion of this episode starts at about the minute 45 mark. On a personal note, fortunately, I found some extra recording time this week, so my fears of missing a week or two because of my recording area being torn up are now abated. I should have enough audio to edit until those repairs are all complete. The intro and outro might be a little wonky, yeah, depending on where I have to record in the meantime for that part. Last week in The Treasure of Capric, Louise revealed to Tobin how she recognized Curian way back when they met in Downriver Town. Tobin was honestly surprised. Fallon found the real trail of the monks, and Xander led them to the gates of the king's camp. This week I'll be reading from chapters 19 and 20, followed by that some thoughts on calling in life. I'm not sure I'd say exactly that it's a behind-the-keyboard segment, but it's a little bit important as part of this episode, so it fits here. You'll understand after you listen. And now, I present for your enjoyment, The Treasure of Capric. The gates creaked open slowly, and standing in the center to greet them was Alden. By the king, you made it, he said, smiling broadly. Louise leapt from her horse and ran to embrace him. Soon he was rushing them all inside the gate and directing them as if he knew exactly what had happened and what Curian's injuries were. I don't suspect you'll want to be separated from Curian, he said as he led them through the camp. So we have made space in the healing house for you. After passing through the gate, they found themselves in a large level area. Tobin looked to the right and left, seeing that the walls of the canyon spread out to a width of several hundred yards. They narrowed again about half a mile to the east. Unlike the rest of the canyons, a few clusters of trees grew near the steep walls. The camp itself seemed to be a semi-permanent settlement within the canyon. Houses stood at random intervals with no apparent organization, but then there were no streets. Interspersed between them were small shacks and lean-tos. Three larger buildings sat at the center, and he assumed that at least one of them was a meeting area. However, he could not determine the purpose of the other two. Beyond them, he saw pens with goats and sheep, as well as a small farm plot. They had all been expecting a group of large, surly men who reeked of lawlessness. Instead, Tobin saw many elderly people, as in Apiford. Most of the inhabitants were closer to Alden or Noman's age, and he was beginning to think that their silent protectors, Elwell and Briggs, were the youngest men in the king's employ. Then he heard a sudden outburst of high, squealing laughter. Three children chased each other through the puddles between houses, weaving through the rain. A lump caught in his throat. One of them had sounded like their youngest friend Simon, who had turned eleven a week before the attack. When he looked more closely around the camp, he saw women and men of all ages. The place was nothing like they had feared. It wasn't a hideout. It was a burgeoning village. Alden took them along the northern wall of the canyon, toward a house that stood beside a pool of water. As they drew nearer, a small spring was visible, spouting from the cliff and filling a small carved fountain that spilled over into the pool. A large cave gaped open like a mouth on the opposite side of the water from the house. It was identical to the dozens they had seen in the canyon, but he suspected this one was a storage place. I hope you are comfortable, said Alden. I would have preferred meeting under more pleasant circumstances. We will do everything we can to help Curian. If you'd like, I can come this evening and play my flute for you. We would like that, Louise said. Alden gave her a confused look. I assumed you would take your normal room. Oh, yes, she paused and smiled awkwardly. Of course I will. It's only that it's been so long since I've heard you play. I just didn't think before speaking. Where's Gideon? Reese asked. He returned to Dury to reclaim his cottage. Reese grunted and his shoulders drooped. 
Tobin wanted to ask questions about the camp, but he felt safe with what he had seen, and he was exhausted. It could wait until they had slept. For now he made sure that Curian was in a bed, under the care of a healer, and then he stretched out in a chair at the foot of his bed and closed his eyes. He had not meant to fall asleep in the chair, but when he opened his eyes, Tobin saw Xander speaking to a short woman in hushed tones. Lamps burned in the small room, and outside, night had fallen. How is he? he asked. Your friend is still asleep, said the woman, giving him a warm smile. She looked to be almost as old as Noman, and deep lines spread across her plump face when she smiled. But her eyes were keen and alert. They shone in the lamplight. This is Carissa, fair child, our chief healer, Xander said. Thank you for your help, ma'am. I'll do what I can, she said, but I'm not certain how much help I can be at the moment. Why? Well, child, he was struck twice, which means twice the poison. My guess is that is why he has not woken. For now, I've given him my favorite poultice. It's a bit sticky, but it should chase that nasty venom right out. And it smells divine. She inhaled deeply and closed her eyes with a blissful grin. Tobin noticed the pleasant aroma for the first time, sweet and floral with a tang of resin. It definitely emanated from Curian, where a golden syrupy smear stained the bandages on his arm and torso. Sweat also beaded on his brow, but he at least appeared to be resting quietly. So will he recover? he asked. Carissa shook her head. Can't say for sure. That stinger in his chest went in sideways. It's burrowed deep between the ribs already, where we can't reach it. Straight for the heart, like I said, Xander interjected. Can't you get it out? Tobin's worst fears were beginning to become real. If it hadn't broken off, we could cut it out. But it's too deep for my skill, said the healer. He needs the king. Now their mysterious leader was a healer? Tobin didn't know what to believe about him or this place anymore. But if they thought the king of the caves could help Curian, he wanted it to happen immediately. Neither of them moved to go get him. Well, isn't he here? he asked. No, Xander said. He often goes off alone for a time, communing, as he says, searching things out. Then go get him. This is his camp, isn't it? I said he goes alone. Nobody knows where he is, unless he calls. Tobin felt as ready to fight Xander as Noman did, except he was ready to skip over arguing and go straight to fists. He took a deep breath to calm himself enough to try for a straight answer. How does he do that if he's alone? How can you tell if it's raining? Xander said in his unusual way, returning an obscure question for a question. When he calls, you know. Can you call him then? Tobin raised his voice and it also rose in pitch. My friend is dying. Maybe it was a myth, Tobin thought, and there is no king of the caves. He couldn't rule it out if they had come all the way to his camp and he was absent. Xander shrugged his shoulders, but looked on him with compassion. The weathered old man lifted the hood of his cloak and opened the door before saying softly, Can you command the wind? When he had left, Carissa patted his arm and said, Don't worry about Xander's drama, child. Our king knows he's here. Chapter 20 The Calling Hurrian. His eyes opened to a dark room. Had someone called him? He was in a soft bed, but he didn't remember how he got there. The last thing he remembered was sailing, but the memory was confused. The boat was large and small at the same time, and the light was both full and dim. There was music and shouting, but also complete silence. He yawned, and a stab of pain in his chest put the memories in order. There had been two boats. Then he remembered the hideous fish and the sharp tines flying toward him. With his right hand, he touched the spot and felt a bandage. 
His fingers came away sticky and he wiped them on the bedsheets. Nearby, he heard the rhythmic breathing of someone sleeping. It sounded like Tobin, soft and quick, rather than the long, forceful breaths of Reese. It definitely wasn't the dean's snore. He felt his eyes drooping closed again, ready to fall back into, hopefully, a dreamless sleep. Kurian. He started awake again. The whisper was so soft it seemed to come out of the air. It couldn't be a real voice. It had to be the remnant of a dream. As he moved his head to look around the room, something was wrong with his vision. The bed and blankets, Tobin asleep in a chair, Everything was outlined in a light that offered no illumination. The room was dark, but every corner and edge shimmered like fire glinting off metal, except white and blue instead of orange and red. James said the fish were poisonous. This must be an effect of the poison, or else a dream caused by it. The voice called him again, the slightest bit louder. Kurian. I'm here, he said. He listened, but no further whispers came. I'm going insane, he thought, and almost laughed at himself. Suddenly he felt compelled to leave the bed, to dress and step outside. He was certain there was something vitally important for him out there. Pain shot through his chest and left arm as he lifted himself out of the bed. It was dizzying, and he had to hold himself against the wall until the lights rocking at the edges of the room stilled. Then he pulled his clothes on with stiff muscles and quietly shuffled out the door. The cold night air shocked him out of his groggy haze, but the sight that met him froze him in place. Every drop of rain flashed with the same glittering light. Blue and silver droplets cascaded around him. They exploded into luminous fountains in the puddles at his feet. The drops shone like the star he had seen on the plain, and now he stood in a flood of stars, as if the heavens had descended to frolic on earth. It was some seconds before he breathed again, and it came with a great sob. His heart yearned for this moment to continue. He wished he could stop time and live in it forever. Through the falling, splashing stars, he could see the lighted outlines of buildings. This must be the king's camp. With the realization, he knew why he needed to leave so urgently. He had to look for the king of the caves. He had to retrieve the treasure, regardless of his injuries. It could not wait. Still, he stared about in wonder at the twinkling rain. After bringing himself to move, he found a fountain in the cliff wall, spilling down into a pool beside the house, and drank. The water was cold and refreshing. As soon as he looked up, something shot skyward in the distance. Above the canyon wall, he saw an enormous column of fire that whipped around like a rope mooring the earth to heaven. It, too, glittered in his vision, as if lightning rode the flames. He knew it was a beacon meant for him. Then he heard it again, this time so subtly he could barely distinguish it from his own thought. Come. Fallon knew his men were tired. He was tired. However, since he could not sleep, neither would they. He had roused them four hours before sunrise, even though they had searched well into the night. His plan was always to bear right, toward the cliffs. They marked every intersection, indicating the direction they had traveled from, and then took the other fork if they came back around. There had been no trail, but he was confident there would be a clue, somewhere. In a day and a half of steady riding, they had only found three branches to the right. Each had quickly dead-ended. Now the canyon looked as if it would run straight for miles, with only small caves that they could search in a moment. If it weren't for the rain limiting their vision, he would gallop through the narrow valleys until his horse collapsed, or he found the monks. Then, for a moment, the sky lit up like daylight ahead. There! Fallon shouted. He pointed to the hills in the east, where a tongue of fire climbed into the sky. It wasn't a clue. It was a signal fire unlike any he had ever seen, as if their prey wanted to be found. More likely, it was overconfidence trusting that their false trail and the winding canyons would ward off any pursuit. What is it? asked his lieutenant, stifling a yawn. An invitation, he said, smiling. Pressing on had paid off. If they had been sleeping with only a lookout awake, they might have missed the fire shooting up from the crags. Then he turned to face the column of riders behind and shouted above the rain, Our enemies have given away their position. 
We must reach them before that flame goes out. At every fork, I want two men to search the canyon that moves away from the fire. Continue to mark searched canyons with stones. If you find something, sound your horn. Start a smoking fire. Do anything to signal the rest of us. Then send one man to find the main force. We will mark our path with torches or spears planted in the ground. Sir, won't that also signal the bandits? said the lieutenant. Let them know we're coming, he growled. But, sir, might they not also escape? Does it matter? That beacon is close. If one of our scouts finds them, the rest of us will be on them within minutes. If they panic and run, they will not be able to hide their trail. His horse snorted and spun nervously under his rage. We will follow them into any corner of these hills and destroy them, he yelled to his soldiers. Ride hard, for Lord Avasius, for your fellows, for Pollingham. His horse reared with an ear-splitting scream and then leapt eastward. A moment later, forty horses thundered after him. Curian stumbled through the canyons for what felt like hours, following the fiery beacon. Sometimes he fell, and each time it was harder, more painful to stand and continue. His tongue clove to the roof of his mouth, and he began to feel hot, even though he walked without a cloak in the cold mountain rain. In his poison-tainted vision, he saw shadowy figures dashing along the ridges to either side. They increased the urgency he felt, as if they were racing to cheat him of his goal but his strength faded quickly. Eventually he had to crawl. Each movement shot through his chest like another quill from the hasslefish, until he feared his heart would burst. Every breath was a cloud of thorns. Then it was in front of him. The fire raged within its column as if encased in glass. It rose directly from the ridge, roiling together with smoke and shot through with lightning. Beneath it yawned the black mouth of a cave, the only thing not lit at the edges. The dark opening seemed to swallow up all light, and it looked to him like the mouth of death. He knew this was his journey's end. He knew the king was inside. With his last strength, he stood and staggered into the darkness as the poison tried to reclaim him. He collapsed, but did not hit the ground. He felt as though he floated into the cave on a bed of air until the dark walls engulfed him and all light failed. Our hero is at death's door. What will happen inside? Join me next Friday as the treasure of Capra continues. Now for those thoughts on calling. It's a concept that gets thrown into a lot of different contexts these days. Uh, obviously it comes in a religious context, but it also just comes in a life context of business or work or, you know, your, your career or vocation. It's a, it's a question that seems to come up a lot when you're younger, obviously, but it can continue for a long time. My father has been saying for decades that he doesn't know what he wants to be when he grows up. At this point, I'm, I'm not sure he's ever going to find out unless he's talking about some element of eternity that I haven't considered. And my understanding of calling was first influenced by uh, Henry Blackaby's study, Experiencing God. It's been a long time, but the most prominent thing I've carried with me from that study is that in order to experience God, it helps us if we prayerfully look to look for where he's already working around us, and then we join in. We're not trying to just have moments with him where we're alone and quiet and all that stuff. We experience him most when we're in the process of what he already is doing and wants to do. And I think that that fits a lot of the people's experiences within Scripture. Samuel is one of my favorites where God called him specifically, but he continued to walk through his life and be where God was working to do those things that God had him do. And he got to see some amazing things, even though he didn't always like some of them. <laughs> There's more than just God's will in this world. There's uh, the, the people and there's other things too. God's will obviously re prevails in the end, but sometimes from our human perspective, it looks like there's some pretty good resistance. 
getting back to Blackery's point, of course, if we are going to look for where God is working and follow him, uh, that presumes that we already know him to some degree, or that we at least have given ourselves over to him. And at this point, Kurian is a man who believes in God, but doesn't really know him. He's a, he's a theist. Uh, people sometimes have asked, which of the characters is most like me in this book? And in this moment, this is where I started. I started out where God showed me something that at least got me to believe that he existed before I fully gave myself over to him. For Kurian, and I'm going to say, spoiler alert, even though it isn't really a spoiler since he's the protagonist, and it's already been hinted that the king could heal him, this isn't the end for Kurian. But in order to progress beyond just acknowledging God, he first needs the type of calling Peter talks about in 1 Peter 2.9 when he says that God call, has called his people out of darkness and into his marvelous light. God calls us to a relationship with him. After he's done that, then Kurian has the chance to engage Blackaby's ideas of looking for God where God is working and joining in. But that's sometimes easier said than done, because we're human. Another book that helped give structure to my thoughts on this was Courage and Calling by Gordon T. Smith. Now, this one was assigned at school, and the suggested idea there is that in addition to Peter's calling to know God and follow him that each Christian has received, every person also has a specific life purpose or a reason for being. It kind of it rests within the mix of our interests, our talents, and also our spiritual giftings from the Holy Spirit. But our, all, our community and the opportunities that are around us can influence this as well. Sometimes God has something right at our doorstep, and sometimes he has us go halfway around the world to do his will. That understanding was a little bit rigid or academic as I read it, but it still helped to settle down my scattered thoughts and give them some structure and give me some things to, to bounce off of rather than just floating around all over the place. What really blew the doors off for me and got to my heart was a book called Desire by John Eldridge. And this book suggested that one of the big keys to finding that life purpose was the way God had wired you. And the things that you get most passionate about, the things that you're excited about, that you want to talk about with people, the things that you just would do regardless of whether you got paid or regardless of whether they cost you something, they don't have to be separated from your faith or they also don't have to be separated from your service of God. Those things can often be an invitation to a deeper walk in faith. And they can also be a way that you can bless others through your unique interest and gifting. It's one of the reasons I write and it's one of the reasons I'm doing this podcast is because that's my unique interest in gifting. And it's also one of the few areas where I have felt God's specific calling to write these stories and have that be the way that I share my understanding of him. And hopefully through that gifting, I get to follow that calling of being a blessing because I want to bless others. That, that's one of the, my, one of my life purposes is to uh, fulfill that, call, that calling of Abraham to be blessed and then be a blessing. Incidentally, I also just can't shake the feeling that Maybe we used to do this a little bit better in church where, where people would, would get together and, you know, do life stuff in addition to church stuff. And so, you know, that's where, heck, some of the most popular singers of the last 80 or 90 years learned to sing in church. And unfortunately, the world seemed to carry some of them away, but many of them still retain their faith. And in at least a few in instances, I've seen young people link up with a, a, a mentor or a, an older person who has similar interests, like, you know, working on, working on cars for young guys or, or even young girls, but usually it's guys. And uh, that can turn into a discipleship relationship as they are doing the thing that they're both interested in that most people would think had nothing to do with God. From my own personal experience, there was one young guy who loved uh, home projects. And man, when I had the chance to, to invite him to come help me out, 
uh, it was a blessing for both of us because I was getting a little bit of help. He was learning as I was building something with him. And we got in those moments to talk more deeply about his life and his, where he was at with faith. And, uh, you know, it, it blessed both of us in a big way. And God was in the middle of it a lot. So those are one of those black and moments of God's working here. Just go with it. Taken together, these three books that I mentioned have really shaped my understanding of calling and they've crept into my story. I believe that we long for God and that we start to become whole when we receive that call to join him by following, following Christ in faith. That calling can come in a plethora of ways, and no person's story of faith will be the same. Some of us come after years of resistance and fighting, and some of us come with the gentlest whisper, even as children. When we respond with the gift of faith, Scripture's pretty clear that His Spirit comes to reside within us, and it gives us spiritual gifts as He sees fit. Those gifts are really, they're not just for us. They're meant to be used to build up the community of the church, to encourage and edify, to teach or correct, to soothe and refresh, and any number of other benefits that God intends to bless people with to build His kingdom. But again, each person's gifting and role will be different, or roles, depending on who you are. Every person's path to finding their role will also be different. Some people have this immediate and direct calling to a particular ministry, sometimes as their vocation. Others of us have to wrestle with God and with our own flesh to figure out where we fit. Some of us feel God's Spirit directly speaking to us within our hearts in a strong way, sometimes often, sometimes not so often. Other people don't hear that at all and God uses the circumstances around them to direct their paths. Each of those ways seems to be represented in Scripture. And so, you know, let's just fall back on God loves to do new things. So your experience might be new, but as long as you can reference and go back and line it up with Scripture and say, yeah, I'm pretty sure uh, from Scripture and, and maybe some counseling with a pastor or other faithful believers, you can say, yep, I'm pretty sure that's the path. You know, if you're trying to be faithful, God will be involved as well and will, he may not prevent you from making mistakes, but he will guide you. Some people experience a specific calling and they follow it for the rest of their lives. Other people like me have different roles in different seasons. And man, it's a, it's a wrestling match each time to figure out, is this opportunity that I'm seeing in front of me from God or is it a distraction? meant to take me away from what I'm already doing. Sometimes he speaks very directly. Sometimes I get this sense or I read something and it jumps out to my attention and I feel God's presence telling me this is what he wants. Other times it's quiet and I feel like a kid who's been taught something and is now being trusted to do it on my own and grow in that way. And sometimes not speaking about myself specifically here, even when we're trying, we, I'm sorry, even when we aren't trying to serve, we can make an impact on someone anyway, just because we're walking with God. When we try to do everything for him, our lives, our whole lives can blend into this mix of, of yeah, our day to day, but also worship and ministry at the same time. The simplest word to a neighbor or some small act of kindness can have something like a a holy butterfly effect when God is involved. That's no excuse to be timid with our walk, however. Relying on God to make those moments happen without us also joining in out of love for Him, you know, that's, that's, timid, that's timidity that He has not called us to. Because God also calls us to courage. I think largely because following Him often means we encounter and engage darkness in this world. So that's a fourth type of calling that those books I mentioned didn't really bring up, but I think is an important factor, especially as we see our world becoming more chaotic in the, in the present moment. And we'll definitely see the need for courage as we near the end of Kurian's story. While he may have responded to one calling, it doesn't mean everything will instantly turn to roses for him. He and his friends will have to walk through that process of discovering these other types of calling together. 
and that, of course, causes conflict sometimes. I hope you'll continue to join me to see that play out, but more importantly, I hope you'll explore it in your own life. God desires for you to know Him, whether you claim to be a Christian already or not. And there are some Christians who don't pursue God in that way. They don't seek to know Him more deeply with each passing year. Man, I would tell you you're missing out if that's you. But really, the calling to join Him in His kingdom, that's just the beginning of the adventure He has for you. And that will take courage. Courage and faith. Those two things seem to just walk side by side in our lives. So if, if you think it might help, I'll include the links to the books I mentioned in the show description. Uh, they are affiliate links. So if you use them, it helps the show and it helps fund my writing and, my, and fund me doing this show a little bit. But you're also welcome to go search out the books yourself. Thanks for listening to my thoughts. I'd love to hear if you have any comments or questions or even your own testimony about God's calling for you. You can send me an email message or leave me a voicemail by going to brandonwilborn.com forward slash contact. I mentioned it in some of the earlier episodes, but I would really love if this after the story segment could include some questions or comments from readers and listeners. If you have specific questions and you'd like me to put them on the show, just mention that when you send me a message. I know some of the podcast apps are now giving you the opportunity to make comments or questions. There's a good likelihood that I would not see that because there's so many different apps and the platform I'm using kind of broadcasts and distributes it to many of them. So I, I wouldn't likely see that. I would see it if you were on YouTube. Uh, that, that's a place where I would see a comment uh, because I directly control that one. But if you're making a comment in the podcast apps, that's not going to work. Uh, or, you know, you can talk amongst yourselves. I'll stop rambling. That's all for this week. Thank you again for listening to the show. If you're enjoying it, please give it a five-star rating and review if those options are available in your podcast app. Then one of the biggest favors you could do me is to share it. If you know somebody else who loves fantasy, especially the classics like Tolkien and Lewis, just let them know you're listening to this story and what you think of it. And uh, maybe share the link by text or email. That's all for this week. Until next time. Godspeed. The Treasure of Caprick is also available in print and ebook formats from all major booksellers. Find a link to your favorite retailer in the show description or go to brandonwilborn.com. That's brand on, not brand off, and Wilborn is as simple as you can make it. W I L B O R N. This has been The Treasure of Caprick, Book One of The King of the Caves, written and narrated by Brandon M. Wilborn. Copyright Brandon M. Wilborn.